thank you very much for uh, attending today. We appreciate you coming along to our session. I feel compelled to point out on the start, we both have AWS on our job title, but I should point out we're actually both from Rackspace, just to make sure we're clear on that from the get-go. Because <laughs> I was standing at, standing at the back, avoiding the speakers, um, standing at the back and realized that it was kind of a little bit confusing having AWS in both of our job titles. Sure. So we'll, AWS asked us to make that very clear. So <laughs> <laughs> That gives you some idea of what to expect from this presentation, maybe. So we'll make a start. Um, today, we're here to talk about something. Uh, it's, this isn't going to be a super deep technical dive into any one specific product. Right, what we're actually going to talk about today is um, the challenge of iterating and overcoming adversity as you move through a technical world, but we're going to do it in a slightly different way. Right, so we're not going to do a deep dive into any technical product or service. So if any of you guys are the people that are here expecting like a deep dive on Redshift or something like that, now is the time where you make that really awkward stand up and move to the back to get out. But if anyone does it, I'm going to totally call you out and embarrass you. There you go. The chap on the left, right there. there we go. <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> um, embarrassingly, I think he's wearing a Rackspace branded T-shirt, maybe. Um, OK, so yeah, so what, what we're going to talk about today is the attitude of iteration. So uh, overcoming adversity and challenges. And we break it down into a couple of different, uh, I guess, perspectives or viewpoints on it. So we're going to start talking about the challenge that we all face. And we're going to talk about it in a slightly more humorous way. We're going to talk about it from a personal life perspective so that everyone can relate to it and we're also going to throw in a few kind of different stories and anecdotes to explain it. I'm getting a lot of feedback from up here. I don't know if anyone else can hear that, but okay. Um, then we're going to talk about the fact that there should be no excuses when you face these challenges and how you can overcome them and the model by which you overcome them and how you drive that throughout your organization and your life. Um, and then Eric's going to take us through kind of the, the fun that you can have when you're overcoming these challenges. So. Just to introduce ourselves, again, this slide will probably give you an idea of what to expect from this presentation. Um, I'm going to start by just introducing Rackspace very quickly. Can I a quick show of hands? Anyone know of Rackspace or is a customer of Rackspace today? OK, that's what we like to see. Good stuff. So I thought it was interesting this morning. If you watched the keynote with Andy Jassy, he was talking about, um, he was using an analogy of superheroes or, or kind of heroes to, to describe how you approach cloud. And while he was talking about it, I was thinking through it, and I was thinking, well, if you think of it like Batman, right? So hands up anyone that's seen the, the last three trilogy films for Batman, the good ones with Christian Bale. OK, there's a character <laughs> the called Lucius. Yeah, the okay. good ones. There's a character called Lucius Fox, played by uh, Morgan Freeman. Uh, he's the guy that kind of provides Batman access to all the super cool toys and gadgets. And if I think of it in a superhero context, I think that AWS is probably like Lucius Fox, right? The guy with all the cool toys and the, the rumbler that comes in black and that kind of stuff. And the customer, the people that are using AWS are probably Batman, right? So you're taking those tools, taking those gadgets, and you're out there, you're, you're you know, writing the wrongs, doing the good things, saving the world one kind of application or business at a time. So I was trying to figure out where Rackspace would fit into that model. And because I'm English, I decided that we are Michael Caine, right? <laughs> we are the Alfred to your Batman. He's so, my boss, so I had no choice in the matter, yeah. just so you all know. Um, <laughs> But I figure we probably take the role of Alfred, right? We patch, you, patch up Batman, we outfit him, we get him ready, we make his tea for him, because it's very British. Um, and we move it forward. But I thought that was a great, great kind of analogy, so I thought I'd steal it and use it for myself this morning, or this afternoon, rather. Um, but yeah, so we're from Rackspace. Um, we provide managed services on top of AWS, as well as several other platforms. Um, and our goal really is to make our customers successful at what they're doing. Um, aside from the terrible attempt at a Movember moustache in my picture. Um, I'm something of a, so on the screen it says scarred cloud veteran. Um, it could be a typo because it could be scared as well. It would equally, equally be applicable. Uh, but I've actually worked for a number of years in cloud. I used to work for Microsoft on Azure before it was launched. I worked for Rackspace for a number of years. I actually went and worked for AWS for a couple of years and I came back to Rackspace last year um, to help build out our, our AWS practice. Um, so I've, I've been around the cloud industry a bit. My partner in crime, Eric Johnson. So uh, I'm, I'm somewhat new to, to Rackspace. I've been with them for about five months. But as you can see, I, I am a uh, 
just, just so you know, this hat here, I'm very proud of this hat that you see. My daughter made this hat for me and insisted that I wear it. So I wore it and there was a picture taken and then you know that's the end of that story. But um, my background, I'm a developer. Uh, I, I've been a developer forever, uh, uh, but then I also love to speak and do things like this. And so I came onto Rackspace to help tell the story about AWS. Uh, you know, it, it's a great product and, and I believe in it and I have a lot to say about it. So, but before we do that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a story. Actually, I'm gonna ask you a question. I wanna ask you, how many of y'all remember your first date? Okay, let me re-ask the question. How many of y'all are waiting for your first date? <laughs> okay, it's a rack space hookup here. So, um, so let me tell you about my first date, but before we start the date, there's some things you have to understand, okay? Uh, there are rules, and you're thinking, you know, rules, who are you? Well, I'm the guy with the mic, so I'm gonna give you rules. Now, these are the rules, and they're very important, or it'll be a confusing day, okay? Number one, this is any number I want it to be. Okay? It's okay to laugh. I did not wake up this morning with one finger because that would be weird and I probably wouldn't be here. Because, Mom, this is problematic. Okay? So number two, how many? Okay. These guys are techies. Yeah. Number two, these are quotes, not apostrophes. I do this a lot. I'll be people like, you know, the other day I was, don't watch. The other day I was working. <laughs> And invariably, somebody in the back always waves. Is he waving at us? I, I don't know. So they wave back with, and it's always their pinky. This is bigger than a pinky, but that's not important, all right? Number three, these are thumbs. Okay, I'm not just pointing at myself. I am arrogant, but I'm not that arrogant, okay? In fact, my school ID is this. You can't see the foot, but it's up. So number four, and I usually don't include this rule. This is a new rule, but you need to understand. He's British, and you're probably not going to understand anything he says. Okay? Not my fault, but there it is. So what's going to happen is I'm going to stand over here, and I'll sign. <laughs> You'll get that later. All right, so let me tell you about my first date and why that has anything to do with, you know, a tech community sitting in a group. So on my first date, I fell in love with this girl in high school because that's what you do. You fall in love with them in high school. And, and I called to ask her out for a date, and I called her, and her mom answered, and I hung up. And... Uh, <laughs> We did that for roughly two weeks. <laughs> Stop calling, you know. And so I finally had the guts to ask her out, okay. So I asked her out on the date. So here's how the date's going to go. Now, I was in high school, and in high school, I thought, man, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But her mom and dad wanted to meet me, <laughs> you know. So I'm like, okay. So I go over, and I meet. Now, we go over there, and we're going to have beans and franks. We're going to have dinner there, and then we're going to go over to college. It's a really cheap date for me. And so we sit down and we're having beans and franks. Now something you need to know about me is I spill everything. Okay, I wish I could blame my hands, but I'm just dumb, okay? I really struggle, oh sorry, sorry, you know, and I, and I just spill a lot. So we ate this meal, and I'm gonna tell you, it was really a proud moment for me. Because we're eating this meal and I ate the entire meal without spilling one thing. Literally, I'm thinking in my head, man, I'm good. So I decided to get brave, and I said, hey, can I have some more lemonade? And so they hand me, and every time I tell this story, it gets bigger. They hand me the jug of lemonade. Now, this is in the 80s, because I'm very young, and this is Tupperware. Do you all remember the Tupperware in the 80s like this? There's some of you older people out there going, yeah, I remember. So they hand me, and of course, it's full. So I grab the jug of lemonade, and I go to, to pour to spill it. Oh, Freudian right there. I go to pour it. And the lemonade, I swear, slow motion like a wave machine. The lemonade goes, and that lid didn't even try. The lid let go, and there was lemonade everywhere. And I was like, oh, no. And so I had, I got two looks. These are two looks that I get a lot in my life. I am different. I do stick out in a crowd. I'm really good looking. And people go, that guy's got one finger, not really good looking. But, um, and so... So I get two looks in life, and, and you get this when you're different. The first one was this, and it was from the dad. And this, you know, this I got because I'm a guy trying to date his daughter, and it literally was like, you are not good enough for my daughter. And he's, he's probably right. I mean, you know. But the second look is this. If, if you stick out a little bit, you see this, and, and you can see it's like, and this is from the mom. She looked at me, and she didn't say the words, but I could hear them in my head. It was, that's the saddest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> that is so sad. And I get that a lot. 
So I figure, okay, I've made, I, I, you know, I've embarrassed myself. It's only going to happen one time, right? The rest of the date should go great. So you want to flip to the next. Uh, this green truck will come up. It's very important. This is a 1976 green Ford F-150. It had a 390 in it. This was my father's midlife crisis truck. Okay, and this is the truck that I was going to drive. Now, this will come into the story a little bit later, but I want you to kind of understand what's going on. So the second part of the date is we're going to go to the library, okay? And so we go to the library, and her dad gets out. Her parents are going to class in this college, and her dad gets out first. And he says, you know what? I'm going to take you guys to get Mary Coyle's ice cream. This is in Phoenix, Arizona. Mary Coyle's is a pretty big deal. And so he, we're going to walk over to the ice cream shop. Now, you can't tell. But my feet are just like my hands. Okay, I have one finger on each, ooh, that'd be weird. One toe on each foot. <laughs> one finger on each foot. Ew, hey, how are you? So, so I've got one toe on each foot. And something that, that affects is when I run, I have to slow down before I stop. If I don't, I will fall before I stop. So we're going over, and we're going to cross the street. She's got her arm in mine because, you know, Young love, and I'm cool, and I've got the swagger. And we walk up to, it wasn't any better then either, I guarantee you. And, and we walk up to the street, and there's cars going this way. I'm sorry, this way, but none going this way. I was in England for a minute. Did yeah. you catch that? Being All right, confused. so there's cars going this, I don't know. They're over on the other side of the median. And we're going to run to the median. She's got her arm in mine. Now, I've seen some of you by your faces, you already picked up on it. So we run to the median. I got no room to slow down. So I stop. And this is where I learned about the transfer of energy. Because I threw her in front of an oncoming car. And the car is locking up. And the dad's behind us. Oh, beep, beep. And literally, in my head, I'm like, look, I'm standing. I stopped. So I figured, it can't get any worse, can it? Oh, it can. So we go home. I didn't get the ice cream. We go home, and they're out in front. Now, she lived on a major street, but kind of on a service road, and I had to turn out. And this is the truck I was driving. And this truck could almost pull the wheels off the ground. It was so quick. So they're all out front. Probably dad to make sure I'm leaving. Mom's got the look. That's the thing I've ever seen. Sister and brother are there. Sister's all raspberry because I threw her in the street in front of an oncoming car. So I get in the truck, and one of the cool things about having one finger is I just put my finger in the little wheel, and I hook it like this, and I, you know, put my, what's up? Does this look cool or what? Yeah. So I put, I got my hand in the wheel, and in the 1976 Ford F-150, the light switch is over on the dashboard over here, and you pull out on it. And so I've got to turn and go this way. So I crank my wheel with my left hand all the way this way, and I start in the turn, and I realize... I can't see anything. There's no lights on, and it's dark out here. So I reach for the lights. Now, this does not look smart, does it? It was not smart. What happened is this big old fat, bigger than a pinky finger, got stuck under the light switch when I pulled it. And in pure panic, I punched that thing. And that truck came alive. Now, they're all in the yard waving at me. And that truck goes, Rrr! and I go out in the street over the median into their yard. And they literally are like, oh, hey, ooh, back up. <laughs> now, the right thing there would have been to say, hey, sorry. It's the saddest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> but no, I punched it. Rrr! And I took off. And I got home. And my dad, who was a high school teacher at the school we went to, I got home and I told him the story and then I did this and then I threw him in front of the car the saddest thing you ever saw and, all this. and my dad was crying because he was laughing so hard. Much like me right now, FYI. <laughs> and so I realized, now here's the point, and you're like, what in the world does this have to do with anything? Here's the point. I really have one. I'm working on one. That night in my life I realized, now again, I didn't wake up that day and go, oh, I have one finger. How does this happen? Two fingers. Everybody likes to correct me. I have, I have four out of my five kids are the same way I am. And they all say, Dad, we have two fingers. OK. So that was the night that I realized I'm challenged. I deal with some things that are not necessarily normal. OK? 
Okay, it started kind of a, of a journey in, in, in how I progress things and how I think about things. And I realized that we deal with challenges on a daily basis. Now, these are, these are kind of the lessons in, in some of the things we're going to talk about today. I, I speak to a lot of groups and I work with, with different groups and in, in our company and in sales groups, things like that, on how do you overcome challenges? Because this is something we all deal with in personal and corporate life. And I want you to think about that as we're talking to you. In what challenges, and you can think on personal, but think in your company, what challenges are you dealing with? In specific, today we're going to be talking about AWS. I'm not up here saying, hey, AWS is a problem and we got to deal with it. I'm actually saying there's some tough things that we have to do when we deal with cloud technology. So we're going to, we're going to talk about what the challenge of that is. If you jump ahead one. So the first challenge that we face, if you think about this, and we're going, to, we're going to talk personal and public and corporate and things like that. We're going to jump around a little bit. But the first challenge that we face as, as leaders, as, as cloud users, things like that, is the, the increased feature set. Amazon, I mean, you heard it. They're, they're almost 1,000 this year. They go like crazy, don't they? And so what happens is we deal with this challenge of this feature set that's just skyrocketing through the roof. And it's a tough thing to deal with. But there's more challenges that we deal with. Yeah, so aside from my challenge of having to be on stage with someone <laughs> who is obviously a proper comedian, I get picked because I'm English, and that's about the only thing that can really make up for the lack of humor in my world. But um, the other thing that we tend to, to face, and, and it goes very hand in hand with this, is as the feature set increases, the pool of knowledge that you have available to you decreases. Right, decisions that you make today may be perfectly valid, but in 12 months when AWS has innovated another thousand things, they're not necessarily the right decisions. The more you go through that, that innovation cycle, the more stuff changes, the, the, the lower level of knowledge that you have in that pool of resource available to you. Right? So it's a kind of a, a two-handed problem that really makes it difficult to keep up with cloud today as it, as it changes and moves through. And I mean, when you talk about AWS, it, again, if you were in the keynote this morning, I'll just recap some of it. Since its inception in 2006, AWS has released more than 70 services, right? Way more than 70 services now. Way over 2,000 services or features. 2016, we left this in here as a question mark because we just didn't know this morning what the number was going to be when they came out with it. I mean, it's close to 1,000. It may even be over 1,000 by the time the year finishes, right? It's a lot. Yeah. So it Officially. really is. It's a lot. And, and it's, and it's it continually growing. Yeah. And, you know, 13 regions, more than 13 regions coming now. Two availability zones in every region. I think they said something like 70 availability zones this morning, globally. Something like that, yeah. There's a huge amount of change being released there, and it's only ever going to get worse uh, as AWS continue to innovate. And the other thing to remember as well is that when they say they've got 1,000 services or features coming out this year, that's not in total since 2006. Right? That's just cumulative. Every single year it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? I've worked in cloud for more years than I care to remember. I've worked for AWS, I still don't know everything about the AWS platform. There is just no way that one individual or one organization that is tasked with doing many, many things, is it when I cross the line? That's your, that's your barrier. That's you it. Can't cross that that line. is the line. Okay. okay. Um, it's just impossible to keep up with it. Now, AWS as a business is 2016, right? We're about to finish 2016. They're a $13 billion <laughs> run rate business, they have over a million active customers. They've got growth that's year on year off the charts, there's a fairly good chance that these guys are going to be around for a while. Right? They're not going anywhere. It's not like next year we're suddenly all going to migrate to the Oracle Cloud and no one's going to use AWS anymore, right? So it's, it's, it's a problem that we have to face. We can't ignore it. We can't pretend it's not going to happen. It's something that we have to address. So the first thing we deal with, the first, I want you to walk away with is, is we're all challenged, aren't we? We deal with the challenge. The second thing I would tell you, and I teach this in my family, and I teach this when, when I'm working with my kids, is no excuses. It's really easy to say, because of this, I can't do this. Because of this, I can't do this. In my family, we teach the value of the word yet. Okay, A lot of times, you know, I remember with all my kids watching them and, and watching them try to learn to tie their shoes. And it's, Dad, I, I can't do this. No, you can't do it yet. There's a difference, isn't there? When I was in seventh grade, I had a teacher who, uh, she, well, my best friend, it's the weirdest thing in the world, my best friend was, uh, was a dwarf. He's 36 inches tall. To this day, he's still a 
He's still a dwarf. That's the dumbest thing I've ever said. He's still a dwarf. It's amazing. And we were best friends. And in class, he, I would notice that I would always finish, or he would always finish the assignments before us. I mean, not, I'm talking, not talking minutes. I'm talking way ahead of us. More minutes. Lots of minutes. Many, many minutes. And, um, he, uh, and I asked him one time. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, I told the teacher the, the assignments hurt my hands. And I'm like, literally, I'm like, brilliant. That's brilliant. So I said, seriously, so one day she's coming to buy and I'm trying to write. And I'm like, ow. Oh. And so she says, so Eric, does that hurt your hands to write? Yes, it does. It does hurt my hands to write. She said, would you like to do half the assignments like Mark does? All right. I'll give you that. So for one semester, I did half the assignment. It was the best thing ever <laughs> until my mom found out. Now, I don't know how she found out. I think my dad told her, but he won't cop up to it. But I, I don't even know how he found out. But here's what happened. In my house, we were taught, you can do anything, and you do not make excuses. And so she proceeded to rip me apart, and then we got in the car, and then we drove to the school, and then she tore the teacher apart. And then we got in the car, and we drove to Mark's house, and she yelled at him and then told his mom. And then his mom yelled at him and yelled at me. We all drove back to school and yelled at the teacher again. <laughs> and I had to redo all of that homework. No excuses. That's the deal we deal with. We, we deal with this, you know, we deal with this idea that I can't. But the truth is I can't yet. And the same type of thing applies when we're dealing with business, when we're dealing with technology, when we're dealing with anything, but it especially applies when we're dealing with some of the cloud technologies that we're dealing with. You can't make excuses. And there's several excuses that we deal with. So typically the first one that you hear when you talk to anyone about cloud, if you go talk to any organization, be they small, large, medium, somewhere in the middle, the first excuse you will typically hear from a developer, an infrastructure guy, or an ops on my guy. machine. Yeah. Works on my, all right, the second most likely excuse you'll hear is, <laughs> it works on my machine, followed by, well, we can't move it to cloud because my app doesn't have the flexibility. I can't change it. We don't, the source code's gone, you know, or it's just, it works, we just leave it as it is. That architectural excuse of, it just can't change to adopt a cloud-type model, right? And I, you hear that all the time. And there are many, many different ways that you can resolve the architectural excuse, right? So if you talk to someone and they're talking about their application and saying, well, we can't move it to cloud because it's really sensitive to latency because it's all synchronous, right? It's like a really big, thick desktop app and we can't move it. Well, there are ways that you can get around that, right? You can figure out how to deliver the, the desktop app uh, as a, a thin client experience. You can move it to an asynchronous communication method. There are many different ways that you can address these. So, I mean, we've listed some of them up here, but you could go on for a long time, right? So, I mean, we talk about monolithic versus microservices. I mean, hands up anyone that's fed up of hearing about the, the conversation around the fact you should move to a microservices architecture. Can we be honest for a sec? How many of y'all think you have a monolithic? Sorry, now we're doing hands for tunes, but how many of y'all think you have a monolithic app? Okay. And how many would like to move to a microservices app? Okay, same hand. Some, some of you, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, these are some things that we deal with. Yeah, you know, testing, for example. Testing is another great one. It's one of those things that everyone likes to conveniently forget about if they possibly can because it's one of those tasks they don't like, mainly because everyone does it in a manual way. We can't move it to the cloud because there's absolutely no way we can test it and make sure that it's actually fully functional. Move to an automated test suite. Sure. Right, move away from the fact that you need to fi uh, find a team of five people to sit in a room for a year clicking buttons and moving through things for you. Um, or the fact that you run everything in a big single, single environment. So you've got a set of dedicated servers on premise and you happen to run dev, test, and prod all on the same servers. I'm sure no one in this room does that, but you'd be surprised how many companies I've come across where you have like a box under a desk somewhere in the corner of the office, and it happens to be running the most critical revenue generating stream of the business somewhere. That's right. right. But these are all excuses that realistically, people say them, you take them at face value, you never get any further, you never improve, you never innovate. You have to figure out how you can overcome those challenges, those excuses by looking at the, the different kind of mappings and ways you can do it. So the second excuse we hear a lot is the knowledge excuse. And this is probably a big one. I mean, I, I mean, you're here to learn about AWS. Some of you may be, you know, there's all, probably all different levels. But one of the excuses we hear a lot is, we don't know how to leverage this new technology and can't afford to support the training to learn. And the basic point is, yeah, we know it's out there, but we can't keep up. 
AWS releases a new service or technology every seven seconds. That's not true, but it feels like that, doesn't it? I saw panic, I'm so behind. I'm like 30, I can't do a visible by seven. 21 seconds behind, that's three, right? I don't do math, I do a little math. I count to four with my shoes off. So, um, but he, here's the deal, we deal with this idea that we don't have the knowledge and we can't acquire it. And that's just simply not true. But here's the bigger thing I would tell you is, can you afford not to? Okay, so let's squash this idea. So first of all, I'm gonna give you a scenario, okay? So we got this guy, he's running, uh, let's, oh, a well, WordPress app, okay? And it's a biggin', okay? That's Texas for big one. That is a okay? really, really yeah, big Yeah, it's a biggie. WordPress app. What's, what's British for big, probably just big one. Okay, all right, so anyway, so he's running this app and he runs 10, how many? Right on, you go, no, that's still one. Okay, he runs 10 servers on an R38X large, okay? And he's running the multi-AZ, and it costs, it's costing him, we're just talking database costs, okay? I'm not even worried about anything else, but just database. He's running MySQL, it's costing him 50,000, or sorry, $55,350 a month, okay? So, he gets smart, he says, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move that over, and I'm going to move that to Aurora, because I've heard really good things about Aurora. So I'm going to put up 10 servers, and instead of multi-AZ, because Aurora is kind of already multi-AZ, isn't it? So instead of multi-AZ, I'm going to do read replicas that I can switch over to easily. So 10 servers all together, and that drops it to $33,969. Okay, so we're happy, right? Now, because the, the idea of this whole topic is the, the attitude of iteration. Is it good enough? Have we tried the next step? So let's look at the next step. One thing he learns is that AWS tests with SysBench on R3 8X large instances show that Amazon Aurora delivers 500,000 select sex and, uh, or I'm sorry, select per second and 100,000 updates per second. That was a long sentence and I ran out of breath. But the idea here is it's five times faster than MySQL running the same benchmarks on the same hardware. Okay, so by simple math, he decides, you know what? I'm gonna, if I have 10 servers, but these are, 10, are five times faster than my other ones that I could handle on 10, I'm gonna drop it to two servers. Okay, and so what he's got is he's now paying $6,793 with a savings of over $48,000 a month. Now I ask you, can you afford not to be informed? Okay, it's not, I have to know how to do Aurora, I have to know everything about it, but I certainly am gonna keep up to date. Okay, this is just a simple, and, and you may say, well, you know, it's not exactly five, that's fine, let's go up to two, let's go up to four servers. We're still considerably less, aren't we? Okay, so the, the idea is you really, you gotta squash the knowledge excuse, you've gotta invest it, because with $44,000 a month, you can afford someone, and I hate to break it to you, if you're hiring someone for $44,000 a month, Talk to me, <laughs> and I will save you this money. So don't do it in front of him. So all right, so, but that's, that's the knowledge excuse. Oh, this is my slide. So um, when you talk about how you resolve that knowledge excuse, uh, I mean, that, that's a great example using Aurora, right? If you think about the savings that you've just potentially created there, you've just justified your next three or four trips to reinvent in Vegas, right, for your boss or one trip if you have a really, really good time on that one trip to reinvent. <laughs> right, but how do you go about resolving that knowledge excuse? Because it, it is a real thing. There's, there's just so much knowledge out there that you need to figure out a way of addressing it. So if you're doing it internally, if you're a large organization or you're an organization that really wants to keep things within your four walls, there are a couple of things you can do. You can create a dedicated cloud team, a cloud center of excellence, CCOE, yeah. as they call it, there you go. Um, you can invest heavily in your employee training and certification, right? AWS certifications. Hands up anyone that's AWS certified in the room. Right, those exams are not the easiest exams out there, right? If you can pass those exams, particularly the pros, that actually means something, right? So investing in employee training and certification, the AWS training, there's a lot of great stuff online. You can build your own pool of knowledge inside your own business. Um, and then something that we as a service provider have had to do, so we had we launched at reInvent last year. We've been in market for just over a year now, effectively. Um, we've gone from when I joined in July 2015, I think we had about 10 certified AWS experts on staff. We have 613 certified AWS experts, and I think 45 <laughs> of those are professional level certs, and 
14, I think, at the last count of those are what we call AWS masters, so people with all five of the, the core certs. Thanks for the yeah, you got it. Go ahead. Sorry. quotes there. Um, and the way we did that was training and providing incentives for people. Right? If you incentivize people to go above and beyond their normal day job, they're going to find it more palatable to be able to go and do that learning for you. Now, if you don't want to go and invest all that time and money internally into building these things, you can look at external options as, and, and how you might be able to cover that, that knowledge gap. Right? You could team up with an AWS audited and certified managed services provider partner that's dedicated to being up to date on cloud technologies. Yeah. This is guaranteed the I don't only, know how that got in there. Yeah, guaranteed the, the only accidental sales pitch in the deck. <laughs> right? You could talk, team up with an MSP like Rackspace. Right? Like I said, We've got a lot of certified experts on staff. It doesn't mean you need no expertise inside your organization, but it means you can lean on us to actually bridge that gap when it comes to it. It is our full-time job to stay up to date with AWS in our AWS business. So, so you've resolved these issues. Okay, Let, let's, let's talk the scenario of you. We're a company, I've listened, you know, you guys are obviously brilliant, so we're gonna listen to what you say. I'm talking about he, he and I. You guys are obviously brilliant too, but we're obviously, obviously brilliant. And so you've listened to us, you say, you know, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. So I'm gonna take and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna listen with that. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna get rid of those excuses. We're gonna put the teams together. We're gonna start learning this. And so what that brings you is, is this idea that knowledge equals informed decisions. Again, it's not a matter of learning at all, but it is staying informed, okay? And it's iterating. It's a constant cycle of what's next? What's next? Okay, how do I stay ahead of that game? Okay, so what we've done here is if you take, if you think about different services and things you're working with, here's how I like to look at it. Here's how, kind of how we look at it. Is we're gonna look at something, and first thing we're gonna ask is are we gonna adopt this, okay? Is, is this, will this improve our applications? You ask these questions. Will this improve our applications still return uh, on investment? Okay, and is, is, it gonna, is it going without, or going without, will it hurt my application? You have to ask that too. If I don't do this, is it gonna hurt it? So we're gonna adopt that. But the next one is, are we gonna defer this? And so what you can do is you can look at something and go, that's good, and we like it, like this Aurora example, but we're not quite there yet. So we're gonna defer that. So we're gonna, until we have the ability to do that. And then the final category that we put things in is, is reject. You know, the gain is not worth the time or money. There are some, you know, AWS services that aren't gonna be right for you. You know, <gasps> yeah, I said it. There's, not gonna, there's gonna be some that are not right for you. And the, uh, the object of, or our job is to say, what works and what doesn't? What's gonna help us? Because you know, first and foremost, you're looking after your company, aren't you? And so you have to decide, is this worth it? Are we gonna defer it? Or are we gonna reject it and not use that? So the first thing we talked about is you're challenged. The second thing we're, we've talked about is no excuses. The third point I would give you when you walk out of here is, you're the model. Now I'm gonna go back to my family for a minute. And it's really interesting, when you're the model, you're the one that makes the decisions and how you, and this is, this is a model we kind of do, how I accept differences and how I accept challenges in my life is the model by which others are going to accept it. If you think I'm challenged, or if I think I'm challenged, you think I'm challenged, okay? So I'm the model for that. But each person has to decide on their own, don't they? We have to empower people to be models as well. One of the fun things with my kids, like I said, I have four, five kids all together, three boys, two girls. And uh, the, the, all three boys and one of the girls are just like me. They're, they're all bald. So, I'm just kidding. That's horrible. It's the saddest thing I've ever seen. So, but what, what I've done is, you know, I can teach them, I can show them, I can model them, but eventually they have to decide on their own, don't they? And here's the fun part. I love, I love watching this happen. And I'll just tell you one of the stories. I've got plenty of them, I'll tell you later, but one of my boys, his name is Jake. We refer to him as Weird Jake. Okay, he's, he's not right in the head, and if he were standing right here, you'd go, no, I'm not right in the head. <laughs> he's a great kid, he really is. He's 14 years old, he's about 160 pounds, and he's six foot, and, and he can take me. So, but he's weird, okay? And so when we were younger, we were out trick-or-treating. And we're coming to the last house, and he was like eight years old, and this is in Colorado where you trick-or-treat in layers, and I think in every state you eat the candy before you get home, but uh, you know, I was checking it for the kids. And so we're getting to the last house, and the last house we have to walk up the side, and there's this big plate glass window. 
And we're walking up to this house, and it's like a little dream. These two little girls, you can see through the window there, they ring the doorbell, and, and Jake's got his costume hanging halfway off. He's got chocolate on his face. He's barely, you know, he's in a sugar coma. And he's kind of standing there, and he rings the doorbell. And these two little girls come prancing out. They're like little six-year-old twins. Oh, la, 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 la. And the mom's following them out. Oh, we'll get it. We'll get it, Mom, you know. And they get right to the door, and I have no idea what happened or why he did this. But Jake gets right down in the plate glass window and he goes, I got two fingers. <laughs> well, you know, the, the dream was over. It fell apart. The girls are screaming and yelling and the mom looks at me and it was not, that's the saddest thing I've ever seen. It was, what is wrong with your family? And all I could say was, uh, I too have two fingers. <laughs> we'll go now, thank you. Jake's going to be all right. He's chosen. He makes the decision to be the model. He makes the decision to embrace the change and challenge that he's dealing with. And that's something we, we have to deal with. Take that out of the personal, drop it into the business, but it doesn't change, does it? We can talk to our people. We can model the, the leadership, but eventually we have to trust them to make the right decisions. So moving on to the boring part of the story... <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about how that kind of applies to us in a, a, a cloud world, right, or in a business world. So there's a, I'm going to name check a book because it's a great book and everyone should take a chance to read it called Team of Teams. So I don't know if anyone has already read it, but it talks about how um, General Stanley McChrystal, the guy that ran the, the task force for the US military, moved his task force from a traditional command and control type structure to a, a more agile modern type of, uh, of organization that allowed them to be much more agile and responsive. And it's a great book. And what it talks about is, historically, we've always focused on being really, really efficient and optimizing everything to the nth degree. Right? So back in uh, 1900, there was a guy called Taylor who ran a steel mill in Pennsylvania. And he took a small portion of his steel mill to a, a, an industrial show in France and set it up in a tent there on the outskirts of the show. And People were coming from all around to look at it because at the time, a typical steel mill could turn out something like, uh, I think it was nine meters of steel chips a minute. Taylor could turn out 50. So more than five times more efficient. And Taylor had achieved this by doing what we now refer to as a reductionist management approach. He took every single component, every single task of that job of producing those steel chips, and he reduced it to an individual scripted, componented part. He measured the ideal distance between workers. He measured the ideal temperature for the steel chips going in and out. And he described everything in very strict processes and procedures. And that's a great system for a complicated system that is predictable. Right? But when you move into a more complex system, and moving from complicated to complex, there is a very big difference between there. A complex system is something that is unpredictable. I'm sure everyone's heard of the, the butterfly effect or the awful Aston Kutcher film of the same name. But, I, um, I didn't understand that last word. What was it? Butterfly effect and what? Aston Kutcher. Aston, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't understand you. I apologize. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, you know it's a bad thing when the translator can't even translate what you're <laughs> yeah. saying. Oh, I forgot to sign. I apologize. But, um, but yeah, the, the idea is in a complex system, a small change somewhere can produce unpredictable results elsewhere. Cloud is very similar. Right? No longer do we have really clearly defined interdependencies between components. It's a very complex system that changes and moves as you work through the day and work through the applications. So the way you move forward with this is you, you, you give up on the reductionist management approach. Right? And you need to adopt a more agile, more responsive approach. And you can do that by taking less of a structured, top-down control approach. Right? So instead of measuring individual things, producing a sheet. When I think about IT, I think about traditional IT where you have the firewall guy, right, that does the firewall rules and configures the Cisco fixes for you order. Wow, Cisco picks, that's old. Yeah. ASAs. Yeah. Um, you have the networking guy that does routing for you. You have... <laughs> does what? Routing. <laughs> Ra that's routing. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> routing is they clean out a toilet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a All right. Router. So, routing is a, a tool you use for woodworking okay. in England. <laughs> wow. Um, so... The guy that does the routing for you, uh, or you have the guy that does the server for you, the guy that does the, the patching for you. Everyone has their own individual job, and no one really looks outside of what they're doing. So it's very, very efficient. But as soon as you get to a point where there needs to be a rapid change, you need to adapt, you need to change something, you need to migrate an application to the cloud, where all of a sudden, one guy with cloud formation can describe everything about an application stack in a single piece of JSON or YAML. All of a sudden, that falls apart. 
a complex system is something where you need to not just be uh, robust in terms of you can tolerate some form of failure. You need to be resilient and you need to be dynamic because you need to be able to adapt to that changing scenario. So that model as you move forward is really important to adopt in cloud. And where we talk about being the model, we look at it from three different perspectives. Right? So there, there are three different ways that you can really look at how you would approach cloud. The first one, we, we call having your head in the sky. Right? We couldn't put having your head in the clouds because this is a talk about clouds. But having your head in the sky is where you, just, you don't know what's going on in AWS world. You don't know what's going on in, in cloud. Right? Your application works. You just get on with it. You ignore everything else and hope that everything's going to be OK. Right? You're not interested in learning that, learning that new technology. And, and if it ain't little, broke, don't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Sure. You're a little bit naive about that. Right? Then you have the other form, which is the head in the sand. Right? That's actually Eric, by the way. It took us ages to line that shot up. Do you see thumbs on that picture? That is not me. <laughs> God damn it. OK. One head, for me. Head in the sand. You had to ruin my one joke. <laughs> Sorry. Head in the sand. So you know what, what to expect. You know there's this cloud thing going on out there. You have a bit of um, knowledge around what's going on and how you could possibly leverage it for your business. But you're going to cross that bridge when you come to it. It's too much to deal with right now. You're just going to get on with things and, and keep going. And as sooner or later, you'll get to it. right? But nothing's going to go wrong in the meantime. Right? And then the final one is you've got your head in the game. Right? You're actually there. You're actually thinking about what's going on. You know what's out there. You're actually aggressively going out and learning the new technologies. You're actually looking at ways that you can improve and innovate on in your business. Um, and having that head in the game is really where it needs to be. But where we talk about the model, it's important to think that as technology leaders and practitioners, right, how we handle this change, how we handle cloud, and the ever-changing dynamic world that we live in these days is the model by which others will handle it. Right? So we go back to talking about the team of teams. Right? You need to have, no longer do you need a top-down management structure where you have a guy that's in charge of networking and he has the routing guy and then firewall guy underneath him. What you need is more horizontal connectivity between the different parts of your organization. I'm not saying that suddenly you're not going to need a networking expert and you're not going to need a server uh, expert, but what you need is clear lines of communication. Right? People need to be adapt, uh, adaptable and able to respond to these changes going forward. And the best way to do that is combining transparent communication with a decentralized decision-making kind of structure. Right? So you don't want one guy that sits at the top of your IT organization that has to bless and approve every single change to the firewalls and everything else. You need your guys to be able to say, right, we need to make a quick change to the firewall. It's a simple, uh, to the security group. It's a quick change. We can deploy it using CloudFormation. You don't want that to have to go all the way up and all the way back down. Because in a moment when you're in crisis, right, something's happened, there's a massive scale event going on. You don't want to be laden down with that traditional top-down, we need to go get it approved by everyone uh, approach. You need to be able to make sure that because the world is changing faster than ever, because your application potentially is changing faster than ever and scaling with different traffic requirements and different threats, you need to be able to present that smartest response by giving small groups the freedom to experiment. And when you think about it, Amazon talk about their two pizza teams. Right, it's a great example of that. Two pizza teams that can focus on solving a problem or a challenge. They don't have to rely on the entire organization around them for specific needs. Spotify calls them guilds. Yeah, yeah tribes and, yeah, and tribes. guilds. Yeah. Spotify has a great model for that as well. And the idea is that you end up modeling this flatter, faster, more flexible kind of structure. But it's not going to happen overnight. You can't just walk into work one day and suddenly everything's decentralized decision making and everyone's super happy, right? You need to go back as the, these leaders and practitioners and demonstrate this kind of model so that people can adopt it, innovate around it. There's no one single answer for every single organization. In the book Team of Teams, it talks about the fact that what they did was unique entirely to their organization. There are some things that you can take away. There are approaches. There are patterns that you can use. But in actual fact, you actually need to go on this journey and iterate through it together. You can't just expect someone to hand it to you on a plate. And when we talk about that model, we're talking about the fact that innovation and impairment, two very different things. There is no in between them. right? You can't be innovative and still be impaired by the fact that your organization won't allow change. That's right. In a cloud world, we talk about try, thing, try new things and fail fast. right? There is no difference. And the way that you have to do that is by modeling this behavior yourself. So why do we do all this? Well. The year was 1984. It's a good story. The year was 1984, 
And uh, this was not me. This was my brother who was also like me. And uh, we're, we're taking over. Ten more and they're going to make gloves for us. So um, <laughs> instead of mittens with the thumbs, you know. So 1984, he's going with a band, a uh, marching band. Yeah, we were band nerds. And uh, there's about 100, 110 of them. And they were going to SeaWorld. Now, we lived in Arizona. They took them to SeaWorld. They were, there was a band competition. Then they were going to spend the whole day at SeaWorld. So these 100 kids are in there. My brother and his friends thought it would be fun to go into the killer well petting tank with packs of ketchup. And they bought the little food, the squids that you feed the killer, the killer well. And he put ketchup all over his hands. He put ketchup all over his squid. He threw them in the tank and came out screaming. <laughs> and they shut down part of SeaWorld for several hours. It was a mass panic. My brother ran in the bathroom, washed his hands, put them in his pocket, and walked out. This is, this is strange. Well, they caught him, and they kicked out the entire band. Moral of the story, have fun. We got into technology because we like it. It, it, pay, it pays pretty well, you know, but we like it. We're nerds. I'm a nerd. My wife will tell you I'm a nerd. It's time to have fun. Now, if you've taken, let's, let's talk about this journey. If you said, okay, we listen to you. We, we worked on our application. Our application is iterative now. We can move on our application. We, we have environments to work on. I can make changes easily. I can make things happen. So I want to have fun. So let me, let me walk you through an idea of what an, an iterative process would look like. So we're looking at a standard architecture. Okay, it's just a simple LAMP stack. You know, we've got some, we've got some MySQL, and uh, we've got, you know, we're running three, uh, M4 is here, so we're using Amazon Route 53, Amazon EC2, Elastic Globe Balance, real simple. Basic price on this would be $875 a month, give or take, depending on some configurations, things like that. So let's get crazy, okay? So we're going to try this thing we've heard about called serverless, okay? Serverless is cool. So we're going to try serverless. So our first foray into serverless is we're going to move from using MySQL on some boxes to run in Aurora because we've heard great things about Aurora, haven't we? So instead, we've taken out those M4s, we've thrown them away, we're still running them on our, on our machines, but now we're running Aurora. And we no longer have to deal with, with maintaining the system. AWS is going to take care of that. Okay? So what does that cost us? Well, uh, it's not the way I was trying to go, is it? Is that the right? Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, all right, so we're looking at this. We go, okay, it's a little more, but what did we gain? Okay, number one, again, we don't have to maintain the systems. Okay, I'm sleeping at night. Okay, so let's get a little more crazy and let's move our hosting. Okay, now the only way we can do this is we've separated our client from our back end servers and we've said we can host, it's just, it's just JavaScript, S3, or JavaScript uh, CSS, and HTML, so we can host that on S3. Do anybody know that? Okay, very cool. If you're not utilizing this and you have just a static site, think about it, okay? Instantly scalable, okay? Instantly huge amounts of storage, very easy to do, especially if you're building spas, okay? Um, so we've done this and we've said, okay, now that we've done that, we've taken a load off our APIs, but we still need to be redundant, so we're still gonna have to. So what did the price do for us? Oh, okay, that's the right direction. We're going down now, okay? Or right, if you're watching me closely. So, and then we've introduced Amazon CloudFront as well. Now, I will tell you, just a caveat, these charges do not include storage, things like that, which you'll deal with. And there are some charges for like CloudFront and stuff like that that are incredibly difficult to calculate sometimes. And, and that's the truth. So sometimes you really gotta watch this and you iterate. You watch it and change as you work it through it. All right, so now we've moved, we've got our hosting moved off, we're serverless on our backside. Let's go nuts and go all serverless. All righty, Lambda. Anybody know, who, who does not know what Lambda is? Okay, good, all right. You may leave, we're done. 
So <laughs> Lambda is very cool, isn't it? Lambda allows you to do event-driven processing, okay? So what I've done here is I've said, you know what, I'm gonna pull my servers out. I was running, you know, I'm, I'm a JavaScript guy, so I was running Express on Node or something like that. And instead, I'm gonna move those to where I handle my, uh, maybe my users on one Lambda, my customers on another, and so on and so forth. So my domain objects are matched to a service. Okay, so now instead of having to maintain a server with all my APIs on it, I've put an API gateway in front of it to handle my REST APIs, and I'm running my Lambdas to handle my functionality, and I do not have to maintain a single server. Okay, I don't care if it costs me more at this point because now we're agile as all get out, aren't we? That was one of the things that he just said this morning is, is that's important, is being flexible, is being able to move fast. But let's look at the cost anyway. What does that do? That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so I've saved some money. Now again, the caveat is this does not include the per run on lambdas, which are done in milliseconds. But if you've done it right, and this is again, you come back to iterating against it. If you've done it right, you have the ability to drop that charge very minimal. I ran a very small website for like, $30 a month on Amazon running, running on a single box. It wasn't redundant or anything like that. I've moved it out, and it's a low traffic. I mean, I'm not trying to compare anything, but I pay roughly a buck seventy-five a month to run it. It's all hosted in S3, a couple of services on Lambda, and I never have to deal with it. If for some reason I get more than my mom and my brother hitting the website every other day, and all of a sudden a million people hit me, here's the fun part. The experience for one person is the same for the experience of a million people because Lambda and EC2 and RDS are going to scale for you. RDS is not quite as flexible. There's some work you need to do there a little bit, but still serverless and you have the ability to grow much quicker. So we've been able to iterate because we took the time to get things in shape and we took the time to overcome the challenges of the knowledge and the, and the excuse of you know, the, the, the different, you know, the knowledge and things like that. So we were able to play around. And that's fun, isn't it? So here's, here's what I want you to walk away with. Like I said, number one, I'm just gonna reiterate these so you have them. We're all challenged, we deal with that, okay? What challenges do you face and how are you addressing it? I want you to think about what's going on in your company and how are you addressing it and is there a better way because you wanna iterate against it? No excuses. Use yet. Hey, uh, boss, we can't do this because we don't have enough money. <laughs> we don't have enough money yet. You're the eternal optimist already. But that's truth. We don't have it yet because we're going to work towards it. What model? We model change. Guys, we're the model. Especially as leaders and implementers, we're the model on how other people are going to handle this. So model aggressive leadership, model this, this you know, you, you take, your, take some examples from what James is saying and, and work your own thing and, and work that leadership out. And finally, and if you're not doing this, get out. Have fun. Technology's fun, AWS is fun. I'm a nerd, I love climbing in there. I, you know, I, I do this for a living, but at night I, I code because it's fun. I challenge you to have fun. Guys, I appreciate you listening to us. We're Rackspace, booth 625. Would love to get your feedback. Please make sure and fill out uh, any evaluations. We want to make this the best we can for you next time. Uh, and I appreciate it. And then James, do you want to say anything? Yeah, thank you very much for coming along, everyone. If you come down and visit us at booth 625, you'll find we have uh, our version of swag this year is actually a, a hangover kit because we figured, hey, it's Vegas, right? So there's some Advil, there's some gum, there's uh, a mask we're sitting in any other sessions that aren't run by Rackspace. So, thank you very much for coming down, everyone. Thank you Have guys. a great time. Appreciate it.